Hey, enough of my books, let's talk about yours. Author C.K. Brooke here. Today's guest is a very special guest. We have Michelle DeLuca. Michelle is an award-winning journalist for an upstate New York newspaper with a fascination for all matters of life and death. Her first novel is called Forevermore, a love story from the edge of eternity. It examines the topic of living beyond this existence in a manner that is unimaginably love-filled and joyful. Michelle, welcome. Hi, Katie. It's so good to be here with you. It is so wonderful to hear your voice. And as I said at the top of the show, this is a very special interview for me, for both of us, because yes, it is. <laughs> Michelle, you are not only my longtime mentor, you are not only my Obi-Wan, you are also my family. My grandmother, Jane, was your aunt. And you and I actually met for the first time, I believe, at my grandfather's funeral in, was that 05 or 06? Um, it, was, it was somewhere around then, and I had already heard so much about you from your grandmother, who was so proud of you. She was my beloved aunt as well, and it's funny that we never met, because she she just, I remember her talking about you and your writing efforts, and she hoped that one day we would get together, and I love that we have this special connection and, and I know that she's watching us today from wherever she is and smiling as well. So. <laughs> it, is, it is amazing because I'll tell you, um, at that time when my, when my grandfather passed away, I was 15 or 16 and I had, it was either right before or right after I had self-published my first like novella um, in high school. And whenever I did any writing, my mom would always pester me that you need to talk to my cousin, Michelle, she's a professional writer. And I was always like, mom, she doesn't want to hear from some pipsqueak. <laughs> Serious okay. writer would never want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew about you for years. And it's funny, I think my grandmother probably made the same suggestion, but I avoided reaching out to you like the plague because I didn't feel adequate. <laughs> and and yet, amazingly, <laughs> it was it was the year after my grandmother died that I finally, finally really reached out to you. And, um, and that was because I had finished writing my very first novel and was in search of a publisher and I uh, kept getting rejected. So I reached out to you to ask if you could look at it and give me some advice. And here we are today, six years later, and uh, you have graciously answered my every email, read and reviewed my every manuscript. So today is this wonderful opportunity that I get to talk to you about your journey as an award-winning journalist, an author, and professional writer, somebody who uses your gifts for the good of mankind. Um, so to begin, Michelle, could you paint the scene for us and tell us when was it and how old were you and where and when did it all begin when you first discovered your love of writing and the written word and thought, hey, maybe I'd like to do this for a living someday? Well, that's a good question. I love when you ask authors that because it's always so interesting how we come to this. I remember being about nine years old and I remember I had read a detective book, a little girl detective book that I had never been able to remember the name of. But she used to walk around writing in her notepad as she was solving crimes. And I remember walking down the alley in my home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and scribbling notes in my little notepad. There's the neighbor putting out the garbage as if I were trying to solve some great crime. <laughs> and that, it entertained me for so long. I never actually considered a career in writing. I was on the school newspaper in the uh, middle school, in middle school, and I was also on the school newspaper in high school and college, but it never occurred to me that I could write for a living until I graduated from college and my, my, well actually, my first year of college actually, when I moved back to Buffalo, my uncle said, I can get you a job as a copy kid at the daily newspaper. And I was like, oh my goodness, wouldn't that be cool? And he did. And I, it was the best job I've ever had. Copy kids are notorious for getting into trouble and 
our main job is to deliver coffee and newspapers and spread stories around the newsroom so the editors don't have to get up. And it was it was the good old days of newspaper when the newsroom was filled with 70 people all working furiously to get the next day's paper out. It was very cool. That's amazing. So I didn't even know that, first of all, that you were, what is it called, a copy kid? Copy kid. Copy yeah, kid. They were, they, were called, they were called copy boys in those days. Even if you were a girl, you were a copy boy. Then the editors would yell, copy! And then we'd have to go rushing over and pull the stories written on this really cheap newspaper uh, paper, and we'd pull the stories off the spike where they had spiked them <laughs> and carry them over to the next phase of production. Um, and in the meantime, we would disappear and go have fun and talk about it. Was, there, were, there were copy boys and copy girls, about six of us every night. And uh, and it was it was a great job. I enjoyed it so very much. May I ask you, like what what era, the what decade this would have been in? Sure. That it, I was hired about 1977, I think. Right about um, no, no further. I'm sorry. It's been a long time since I looked this far back. <laughs> um, it was about 1973 because it was my first year of college. Okay. And. Uh, and I, again, I, it, it really just evolved over time. I was working in a newspaper full time and having the time of my life and decided to change my major from phys ed because I was a gymnast in high school to um, communications. And when I graduated, they hired me. So backtrack, how did I not know you were a gymnast in high school? I love U.S. women's gymnastics. I'm a huge fan of Gabby Douglas and all that. Like, that's like one of my favorite hobbies to watch that stuff. So did you? how long did you do gymnastics, I have to ask? When I was in high school, especially in my senior year, we had a half a day. We went to our classes in the morning, and my friends and I, we're done in the afternoon. We had our afternoons free, so we would go to the gym and hang out with the gymnastics teacher, and she got us into, I competed in the uneven bars, which I loved. It was like flying. My my dear friends um, were literally tumbling uh, uh, because they were cheerleaders. I was not. I was a newspaper reporter in high school. <laughs> they were cheerleaders, and I used to wear a crumpled up old raincoat and smoke cigarettes just so I could fill that role. <laughs> I love the visual. That's this is so cool. Learning all of this, and I'm, right now I'm picturing. I'm sure my mom will be listening to this, and she and she'll love picturing it as well. Um, so that's fascinating. So you actually changed your major because you were having such a great experience as yes, as a captain. Before kid. we go one step further, yeah, um, I adore your aunts and uncles and your mother. Um, they were a bright spot in my childhood. Moving on. I just wanted to say that. That is but, so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, what did you say? Um, you asked me about? Oh, um, so when you decided that you wanted to maybe do this for a living and you changed your major to communications. Then it was just every, I was like a sponge in the newsroom watching what happened, who did work well, who, who you know, who was, the, there was something very, very important I learned in that in that newsroom at the Courier Express in, in Buffalo, where this all takes place. I learned that it didn't matter what sex you were, what race you were, what religion you were, or who you were. You could have been an alien with five eyes and antennas, but if you could write a news story, you were accepted 100% in the newsroom. I can tell you that's still true today, and it's why I love working in a newspaper office so much. Beautiful. And where did you, where was your um, where did you go to college? Well, I I started college after after I graduated from high school in Milwaukee. My parents had moved back to Buffalo to be with family. And when I got here, I had just graduated high school, as I said, and I started college at Canisius College, a private school, to major in phys ed. Then I got the job at the Courier Express as a copy kid, and thought, my gosh, I could make this my career. And I went to Buffalo State College to major in communications. And honestly, I learned so much more in the newsroom than I did in the classroom. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> and I just feel, I, I felt like it really shaped me as a journalist working there. So when you 
become when you climb that ladder from copy kid to now you you're a columnist is that would that be what you'd call yourself or or journalist for Niagara Gazette the funny thing about the newspaper industry is that it has shrunken so severely that my newspaper now I work at the Niagara Gazette in Niagara Falls New York and the newspaper staff has has simply by by virtue of trying to stay financially alive mm-hmm. we have a very, very small staff now probably about 10 people total and then we have of course the advertising department and the other departments the mail rooms the press room and the people that deliver the papers but our newsroom is very small so we all wear several hats so i am a columnist i write a column every thursday that appears on the front page and it's still thrills me to see my column on the front page after all these years. But I also am the Lifestyles editor, so I do the Sunday Lifestyle pages. And I am the editor of a new food magazine called The Lish that comes out every two months. And that's really entertaining for me because there's a lot of good food involved in the research. That's so cool that, I mean, it's sad that the industry is shrinking and the staff is shrinking, but it is so cool the different hats you wear, the different roles you play for the Gazette and and for this new magazine. Um, Is there a specific topic that you're writing on? Because I I know I definitely want to kind of segue into your unique outlook on on just humanity and the world and uh, spirituality, life after death. Um, Can you kind of tell me the story of, of what you what were the first stories that you were assigned to write about? Um, or were you allowed to just write whatever you wanted? Um, and, and how did that evolve over your career into what you're doing now? Well, it started for me as a young reporter. Uh, my, one of my first stories was to interview a psychic who was teaching blind people how to see colors and how <laughs> to see, uh, how to travel in their minds. So say they're going to a convention, they could travel ahead in their imagination and try to be comfortable with what they're going to find when they arrive at their destination. I thought it was an extraordinary story, and I came back to the newsroom that day, and I remember telling my city editor, this is so cool, this psychic is teaching blind people how to feel colors with their hands and how to mind travel. And this woman walked by, she was a acclaimed columnist, much older than I was, And I so admired her. And she said, that woman ought to be in jail. (laughs) And that put such a damper on my story that day. And I was was kind of embarrassed for kind of falling into belief of something that a much cooler and wiser reporter thought was um, balderdash. But um, I, I kept that psychic in the back of my head. Uh, always wondering what she was up to. And and when my newspaper closed, literally shut down 800 people put out on the street um, in 1982, I sought her out um, to do a, to do a story about her for, I wasn't sure what yet. I figured I'd sell it somewhere because I found it so hopeful. She invited me into her classes as a journalist, but then by mistake, I started participating. I'm joking. She also (laughs) invited me to participate. I hadn't planned to. And I found out that not only myself, but all of the people in the classes that we took from her had psychic abilities of some sort. And it just set me on fire to find out more. And when you say you found out they had psychic abilities, was this something that they demonstrated in front of you or, or that they claimed or... Well, we did a series of exercises every day, the courses, a couple of different courses over a series of weeks. And in my first week-long course, there were truck drivers, and there were husbands who had been dragged there by their wives, and businesswomen, and young men. And there was about 30 people that I like to describe as the same 30 you might find in a grocery store line, you know, all of us different. And as we went through the exercises, it was clear that each of us could do some of them, not all of them. For instance, I could hold a set of keys in my hand and describe for the person who handed them to me who they belonged to and what that person looked like. I thought that was really interesting. It's a skill I've never used since, but it, it, it taught me something about my mind and made me, I think, much clearer on my abilities to 
believe in what I was thinking. If I, it, you know, literally to use my intuition more, even if I didn't call it that, you know, even if I mm-hmm. called it gut instincts. Mm-hmm. But as I got older, I was aware that intuition was was the tool for creating your best life. And you demonstrated a little how, you know, some people in the very beginning might have kind of sneered at that uh, or looked down their nose at it. Um, Did you face a lot of resistance when you started wanting to write about these topics? Um, Or did it, did you have a good opportunity to kind of slide into that? Or how did that go for you? Well, that's an interesting question. My, um, newspaper had closed, as I said, so Mm -hmm. I found myself without a job, and I had a lot of time to pursue um, what you might call an alternative lifestyle or or alternative thoughts about human capabilities. I like to think that I am a human potentialist. That's the word I created for myself, and then I found out later there were other people using that word. I love that word. (laughs) Human potentialist? I love the idea that we have so much potential that we simply don't either we're we're not aware of or we don't believe in and when you open your mind to them these these capabilities that I believe we all have then your life expands exponentially so where did you resume employment after that paper shut down and I also want to know what kind of dog you have (laughs) thank you I I have a Doberman and he's the sweetest little guy um He's very shy, and, and you can't laugh when he does funny things or you hurt his feelings. Oh. Um, he has this big, mean bark, and he's barking right now. So if this becomes too much, you let me know, and I'll... No, it's fine. I think the majority of people listening are dog lovers, and they don't mind at all. It's <laughs> wonderful. And we are in the market for a dog right now, so we'll be there soon. <laughs> so it's fun to think about. Okay. So your employment... Um, as you, where, where did you resume employment after that paper shut down? Well, that's funny. You should ask because I fell into a situation with um, a, a young mom like myself who was doing a holistic healing journal, and she asked me to be the editor. And we spent five years not making any money at all, but having the time of our lives with a couple of other young people producing this monthly magazine that eventually uh, went national, Um, but then those kind of things in those days, especially this magazine, didn't have the finances to support it, Mm -hmm. so we parted ways um, cheerfully and lovingly, but it was a wonderful time in my life. I got to interview many of the the top names in the holistic healing field. Bernie Siegel, I drove to his house in Connecticut and literally sat down in his kitchen and interviewed him. He is the surgeon who wrote Peace, Love, and Healing and began talking about, from conventional medicine, began talking about how our belief system influences our healing. Wow, so kind of like uh, Louise Hay um, and that type of thought movement. Um, So backtrack a second because you said that at the time you were a young mom and that was actually one of the questions on my list for you next was um did you take a break at all from your career from writing to raise your children i know you have two sons um who are grown now of course and um or did you do both were you a working mama um how did that how did you weave motherhood into this basically the most interesting thing to me about that period of my life was that i really felt frustrated in my own ability to get full-time employment and I, I took that as some sort of a uh, some sort of an inability that I had within me to, to to find a job and in fact what happened was I had this wide open opportunity to explore all the things that I was beginning to find so interesting and as and as a result I was home a lot as well and my children benefited from my attention. So it really turned out to be the greatest blessing of my life because my sons, I'm pretty happy with the way they turned out. I, in my own mind, I think of them as extraordinary. And I hope all parents think that of their children, but, but I think my sons are extraordinary and I believe it was because the extra blessing of my being there throughout all of the years of their young lives, you know? That's beautiful. So you were able to basically be a stay-at-home mom 
um, and you didn't have the demands or the pressures of, of some uh, work-a-day job interfering with that. Um, and that's kind of the boat I'm in now, so I can certainly relate to you um, that I'm able to write kind of on my own time, do these interviews and other marketing things while he's in school. Um, but then when he is here with me on weekends, evenings, summer break, holidays, I can give 100% to him. And I think it just creates a great balance. So it's nice to know that that it worked out for you that way as well at that time. It so did. And I, and I really appreciate that, that you can see that. Oh, yes. I totally, <laughs> especially in my little boy's case, um, yeah, he he benefits greatly from the one-on-one -on -one and the TLC and, and just, you know, me being hyper-focused on him. Um, so before before I get into your, your novel, um, both of your publications, um, your, your literary publications, and um, into your whole publishing um, journey, I wanted to kind of ask you, because this is something that I'm just fascinated to hear from a, a real journalist, um, can you share a little, how has journalism changed and you've kind of touched on that earlier with the, the industry shrinking. How has journalism changed and, and transformed or, or mutated, depending on how you look at it, with the internet and social media? And the new attitude of our president about the media? <laughs> you're, the, you're the enemy of the people. <laughs> the enemy of the people, yes, which is so funny because those of us who have trained to be journalists consider ourselves the front lines of the truth. Yes. And that's, you know, that's why we're drawn to this business there. I still remember when my city editor called me to the, called me to his desk and he was reading something I had written and it said, the woman smiled happily. And he said to me, can you prove she was happy? And I said, no, she looked happy. <laughs> he said, well, then you can say that she smiled because you saw it, but you can't say happily. He crossed it out. I took that as a lesson because in my business they say, if your mother says she loves you, get three sources to back it up. <laughs> and that's pretty much so. Uh, and I understand how the how social media has changed things because everyone now calls themselves a journalist or a newsmaker. I mean, sorry, a news uh, a news person or a and blogger or just exactly. some Everybody yeah somebody with an opinion. I'm okay with that. Except that many of them don't live by the same tenets that professionally trained journalists do. Who, professionally trained, changed, pro professionally trained journalists who are brought to the field because because of their um, belief that the truth will set us free, as they say. And honestly, the whole point of when I do a story, the whole point of doing a story is to find to find a balance to present both sides. I'm pretty good at that because I'm a Libra. I always see both sides. I understand why people do what they do. That's a gift of mine. And it also makes me a good journalist. And I always try to present both sides of every story. I recently did a series on Love Canal, uh, which was an, one of the first environmental disasters in the country and was the, the reason they created a super fund for cleanup. And Love Canal occurred in Niagara Falls, and I just wrote a, a, a series on the 40-year anniversary. And, and I had to present both sides. So I sat down with people who assured me that Love Canal was safe to live around now. And I also sat down with people whose children were very, very sick still because of living in Love Canal. And I had to present both sides because that's the way a good journalist writes a story like that. Michelle, for all the millennials listening, could you clarify what Love Canal is? Sure. Love Canal was an environmental disaster where a chemical company buried 80 tons, 80, 90 tons of chemicals and thought they were safe um, until they started showing up after a huge blizzard. They started erupting from the earth and breaking open and children were playing in orange chemicals and um, it was seeping into homes and basements in this little community in Niagara Falls. And um, it was a disaster. 300 families were moved from their homes, but they had to fight for years to, for the state to, to move them 
because they were they were middle class families. Nobody had the money to pick up and leave their homes behind and find somewhere else to live. And eventually, uh, the state agreed after much protest and and many loud, angry meetings to move them. And it's a it's a story that we all need to hear again and again, so that it never happens again. It kind of reminds me of the Flint, Michigan water yes. crisis here in Michigan that we've. It's been a very awful, awful thing that has happened to my state um, and to those poor children who are permanently poisoned and brain damaged as a result. Um, and also kind of rings of, you know, Aaron Brockovich, you know, there's, there's been these, um, these environmental disasters that have really hurt people. So it, you know, it's not, and you said that that happened 40 years ago now yes, at Love Canal. Yes, Love, so, okay. Love Canal, uh, for those who study the environment, um, started, was the reason for the creation of the the National Superfund for Environmental Cleanup. And Lois Gibbs, the housewife who led the revolution against the government, said, you must move these families. She, she consults now on environmental disasters like Flint, Michigan. That's how she spends her life. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, she's, she's a pretty cool human. So, and, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, typically these things are, these uprisings are led by mothers because their children are impacted. And in that place, they will fight anyone and anything to, to, um, to save their children. 100%. I can tell you nothing has impassioned or enraged me more at any point in my life than when I became a mother and then really could appreciate when there was any kind of violence or injustice and your first thought of course is what if that were my child Absolutely. and you picture your child and it doesn't matter you know if my child was six months old or six years old and the victim was you know 17 or 60 or five or what you know you picture no matter how old you are no matter how old somebody else is when you become a mom you picture everybody as what if that were my child? Even when I get really angry as well with politicians or people in the news, I still have to temper it with that's someone's little boy. Yes. <laughs> and that's that's honestly what keeps me a lot of times from flying off the handle. That's someone's little boy. They were once an innocent child, just like my son, you know, try to, <laughs> but that's a that's, whole other, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah but, but, but ultimately, that exact way of thinking led me to try to figure out how I could tell, because I was steeped in the real world in the newsroom. I, I was up to my knees in toxic chemicals at some points, not really, but <laughs> metaphysically speaking, uh, toxins of the world. And I, I, had all, I was learning all, this, all these lessons in the readings I was doing about our potential as humans and our connectedness and how important love is and understanding that that other person is connected somehow to you throughout the globe that we're not different and distinct individuals but we're all connected by what i came to believe was the source of everything the god source that we are like a drop of a drop of the ocean in the great spiritual ocean we are we are the same energy as the God source. And I wanted to find a way to get people to understand this. That's what brought me to my first novel, my only novel so far. And Forevermore is your first novel. It, it is not your first um, book because you had written um, a nonfiction, sort of like a, like a memoir, Gifts Yet to Open, which is that still a free book on Kindle? Yes, it is. And it, it will always be free because... Um, because I want it to be free, but yes, it, it is a free book, and uh, it, that tells the story of my, my learning, my lessons from that psychic that I spent time with at that part of my young life as a, as a young mother, and uh, how it influenced me to, how it influenced me in the raising of my children, and... 
I strongly it also, it also oh, contains three chapters of Forevermore, so people can get a taste of it. Yeah, so it's a, it's good marketing promo too from the author standpoint because um, a lot of writers and, and authors listen to this as well. And so that is something um, that I strongly recommend is that you have a, we call it perma-free, permanently free. Um, so not just free for you know the five-day promos per 90-day period that you can do with Kindle Select, but um, but a, a permanently free ebook. On Amazon, it can be a shorter book, uh, prequel, something, you know, some other, um, like in your case, this little memoir that um, introduces people to who you are, to your your beliefs, um, to your worldview, um, to even tapping into their own untapped potential. And then at the end, you tack on a sample of of your one of your books that is for sale or the next book you know that you're leading into um so that's a great marketing um opportunity but it was also i found a great little manuscript you had sent it to me before it was published and i read it all um it was one of those very few uh books that you know working working drafts um that people send me that i'm actually that i was actually like really looking forward every time to sit down and read it, and it, it was it's it goes by quickly. It it kind of um, you know you just kind of swipe through the pages and you're just intrigued and and you want to know what happens next. Um, and it's it's there's nothing um, that's particularly you know some memoirs or autobiographies are are very heavy and there's like scenes that are really rough to get through. There's nothing like that in this. Um, it's just this beautiful little story and you really get familiar with Michelle's voice and um, with her experiences. And um, so I strongly recommend to go on Amazon and download Gifts Yet to Open is the title. And it's it's just a very sweet little book. And um, so, so that I can see how you being a journalist and writing about these kinds of topics would then segue into you publishing something nonfiction, something autobiographical, um, more so on these topics, but you've also written forever more. So why fiction? When you said a few moments ago that you wanted to be a writer to, um, I don't want to say spread, but just to create awareness of um, of this other way of looking at things, of this other spiritual worldview, and to create awareness of the importance of love and our interconnectedness as humans. Um, why did you choose to tell that in a novel as opposed to a nonfiction type of book, like a how-to book or the kinds of self-help books um, that you see published by like Hay House. Why a novel, Michelle? Good question, because I'm a journalist. You'd think I'd want to write what I know to be the truth. But in fact, the things that really struck me as I was, as I was coming into these new beliefs was the storytelling. I really deeply loved stories by Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel and, and Bill Celestine Prophecies, which I don't believe was written all that well, but captivated <laughs> people with its message. There were a number of other fictional, new agey kind of books that, that told wonderful stories and, and captivated me, and they were also easy and fun to read. So I thought perhaps I would take all this information that I had learned and put it into a compelling story and include nothing that I didn't know had actually had, had actually been said to have happened in real life through books and stories that I had learned or people that I had talked to. And so, and plus the story just fell into my head. You know, any author will say that on occasion and feel lucky about it, but there's this story that has to be told and you just sit down and write it. This one expanded as I wrote it, created characters along the way that just fell into my head and onto my laptop. Um, again, that would be familiar to the writers who are listening to this. It just came, and and it, it uh, the story is either going to upset people who read it or delight them, depending on where they are in their journey. Some people are upset by it, and some people are delighted. And either way, to me, it just it's uh, an opportunity to make people aware of some of the things that are happening out there today that people are telling stories about, real life stories. 
for people who are not familiar with your novel, it's called Forevermore. Um, and I just want to kind of, if I were just at the coffee shop describing like, oh yeah, I read this book um, the other day. And, um, you know, this is kind of the, the nutshell how I describe it. I'd say it, it's a lot like what dreams may come, but with none of the tragic or hellish stuff that's in that book. All just all of like the heaven and the whimsical afterlife type of stuff. But it's also, um, instead of told from a male point of view, it's more like a Sue Monk kid novel. She's the author of The Mermaid Chair and The Secret Life of Bees, which will always, both of them will always be two of my top 10 favorite books of all time. Um, where it's written in this feminine and just spiritually expansive point of view. It's also written from the point of view of, the, you know, this is not like a young adult novel or a new adult novel. You finally have a, a mature narrator. This is an adult narrator. Um, you even described it, I think, in one of your query letters as a baby boomer romance, which I love that because baby boomers are a huge generation and I'm sure they are sick and tired of all the YA stuff out there and they want something for them and for their audience. And so they're certainly a market for that. Um, so it's like a, it's a baby boomer metaphysical romance. Um, but, but you don't have to be a baby boomer to enjoy it. I'm, um, I'm not sure. I'm kind of, some people say I'm a little too old to be a millennial. I guess so I'm like an older millennial, whatever you go, zenial, whatever you call that. Um, I'm, uh, a zenial, because I'm a, I'm on the cusp of Gen X and like my, my older brother and my husband are Gen X, but I'm, technically a millennial but i don't you know i didn't have the same upbringing as millennials because i didn't That's you know funny though i actually thought you said zenial yeah i, like that. I did yeah oh z yeah. okay yeah gen z <laughs> yeah they i some people call it, so so uh generation aside you know whatever generation i am um not a baby boomer but i enjoyed this book immensely um, and I and I enjoyed your writing style. Um, it is it is easy to read. This is not like some dense dissertation on on religion or something like that. You know, it, it's it's this very light, gentle. You just feel like just reading it. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to know Michelle and be related to Michelle. But even if I wasn't, if I was reading this book, I'd feel like, gosh, I really just want to go get a cup of coffee with this lady. Like she just seems like somebody who's just so like optimistic and inspiring, but also like chill and calming. And you just, there's something about your writing that has a soothing quality. Um, but it's also interesting too, because the characters, um, again, it's not, it's not too, too overly heavy. It deals with very, very deep concepts of, of life and death and life after death. And, um, and there's, there's betrayal and there's mourning and there's, um, complex relationships. There's all of that in there. Um, but it's, but it's presented still in this gentle way that makes it palatable. Um, so, so you write, this novel, and I remember when you were in the process of writing it, I think was at the same time um, that I was in the process of, of looking for my very first publisher, um, so like circa 2013, 2014. Can you tell me how long did it take you um, to, to write, and um, then can you walk us through what was your experience with once you'd finished it, um, where did you go from there? Um, how did you seek for agents and publishers? You know, what, what was this whole writing to publication experience like for you? Well, before I go anywhere, I want to start with the title, Forevermore, A Love Story from the Edge of Eternity. My husband, who is not a reader, read the whole book, enjoyed it very much, which stunned me, and then said, I hate the title, you ought to call it, I Fell in Love with a Dead Man. <laughs> and maybe he's right from a clickbait <laughs> point of view. He's, and, um, he's one of my biggest supporters of this book. It's so surprising to me because he is not metaphysical in the least, but he loved the story and, and others have not. Okay, but back to the question. This took me about a year to write. I worked full-time throughout that writing every day at the newspaper, <laughs> so I'm pretty 
pretty impressed at myself, but he would, my husband would literally bring me my computer and a cup of coffee every morning, and I would sit in bed for an hour with my laptop on my knees and, and write a little bit of the story every day for a year. And wow. that's how it was born. So he was kind of the midwife of, actually, I've never said that out loud. Ah, yeah. I love it. Um, but um, so the book was written, and then it took about a year with, with, with your help by the way, um, I cannot understate or I cannot overstate, there it is, I cannot overstate <laughs> the importance of your role in my life at that time. You were my cheerleader then and I'll, I'll never forget that. You were my very, um, very, very extremely double capable copy editor. Oh. And you, are, you are ruthless for <laughs> Sorry. who need a ruthless copy editor. That is the highest praise you can pay a copy editor is that they are ruthless. <laughs> And um, for that, I will always be grateful because the book, people read it, especially some people who really uh, read a lot and they read a lot of uh, independently published books and, and have, they have said to me, it's so clean. And I attribute a lot of that to you, Katie. So thank Aww, you. Thank <laughs> you. And I have to say too, it's right back at you because you, your book was one of the first that I edited and um and you gave me some wonderful advice I, I i was recently um my last interview was with verica sloan who's a, a romance author that i've been um her editor since 2016 so going on three years now um and she calls me the iron feather um it, <laughs> and and but but you taught me actually um to not be quite so ruthless and to you said to me um, when I told you I had like my my next editing gig, you said, "Don't break her spirit," and I have reminded myself of that literally every time I've sat down to edit ever since, um, because that's very important advice for an editor to remember. Is though even though um, on my end I might feel like I'm nudging you and winking at you and smiling at you any time I insert some comment or or you know change something around or make a make a sharp suggestion um when the author is receiving their baby back to them and going through it um without the context of of body language <laughs> that those comments can be very can be construed as being very biting um and like you know and so i i felt so bad about that um i just wanted to say <laughs> And That's so funny. It's what you do is a gift. It's a gift to every writer. But it, it it's one of the things I've learned as an editor. I my role in life is to raise up young journalists and to teach them their power. That's the role I've given myself. And I too need to be careful not to break their spirit because what they are choosing to do as an occupation, like all writers, is to reflect the world back to the world and we can't have enough of that from thoughtful, intelligent people. That's beautiful. So I mean, so I guess you can relate to the same. We've both been in each other's shoes, I guess, which is so yes. funny with each other because, um, yes, you have been um, certainly my mentor. And um, so I have, I have also thought that as well when I am editing for someone, I'm like, okay, my job is not to change their voice, is not to... Uh, ridicule their voice or shame them for trying to use their voice um, in a way that maybe was misguided at some point or just incorrect or whatever. You know, my my role is to um, help their voice shine brighter. Mm, that's lovely. I like that. And polish yes. and and just refine it. Help them find it and define it and make it as strong as possible. So to enhance. Um, their voice and, and to make corrections where corrections are due, but um, just to to help them say what they're trying to say in the best way possible. That's that's really going to be understood, um, you know, and and reached by readers. So um, so thank you for for your kind words on my role in that book. I'm very proud of my role, however small or whatever size role I played in um, in the execution of that. And I know that once you finished it, you did query some agents and publishers. Um, tell us what that was like. Honestly, I have to say, I knew so intuitively that this book needed to be out in the world. 
I didn't have time to query many agents and publishers. And honestly, I know enough about writing for the world that I believed that I would put it out. I decided to publish it myself and allow the people who needed to read it to find it. That hasn't gone as well as I'd hoped, although I have wonderful comments on Amazon. Um, when I don't push the book through advertising, it doesn't go anywhere. At some point, I had a, I had Forevermore free last Valentine's Day, and 4,000 people, I think, uh, downloaded the book wow. or uploaded whatever we say. And Download, yeah. It was extraordinary, and I got some great reviews, but without me intentionally putting it out there, it's not going to go anywhere. I know that. And yet I still believe in my mystical sense that those who need to read it will read it. And it's still, it's, it's, it's like a crack in a window. It's very slow to move out into the world without me giving energy to it. But I don't have the energy right now. And I'm not even sure that I, I'm not even sure that that's my role beyond writing it and putting it out there. And that's really interesting because, um, you know, most of the authors I've spoken to for this segment um, are very much in the marketing aspect of it. You know, this is a, um, uh, you know, this this is a business for them. Um, I look at myself as, I mean, I guess I'm a hybrid author because I have publishers, but then I'm all, I also am self-published. Um, and the publishers that I do have are small press, so uh, you know they by no means have the budget of one of the big five. Um, so I, I have to do both ways, no matter how I slice it. I'm doing a lot of my own marketing myself, and um, I look at myself as a small business owner, basically. Um, yes. That's what you have to be to be an indie author. Um, and so it's really interesting that you are taking this more peaceful, philosophical approach to it that, look, I understand my book is not for everybody. Um, there are, this book has specific readers that, you know, I believe will find it if they need to find it. And, um, and that is certainly one way of doing it and one way of looking at it. You know, some people just have a story they want to tell and they're not so much concerned about the market or sales or making money off of it or building a business or, or a career off of it. I mean, you are you already have an established career and you already are an established professional writer um, and you certainly have a platform of readers and you have um, for a long time now. And so writing this book sounds more like this was definitely a, a cathartic and uh, it, it was a creative expression. You know, it was a creation and, and you were expressing something, um, but you're not necessarily trying to build a business off of it. And that's okay too. Those kinds of writers are needed too. It's, you know, not just people trying to write for the market or find what's hot or what, you know. Um, so I admire the integrity. Um, that said, you did have a really unique, I think, unique and really neat, uh, I'll call it marketing adventure, where you recently went on an RV tour of your book around uh, across the East Coast. And so can you tell us about that? Well, honestly, it what my husband started it off by. We were taking the trip anyway. He, It was a bucket list thing, and I got a couple months off of work, which actually wasn't really off work. I just took my laptop with me and worked from the RV. But we took a trip down the Atlantic coastline and on occasion stopped in New Age bookstores to promote my book. That is a that is hard work. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard work to find the people that will see you, and it's hard work to 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 get them to take your book. Even one of the New Age bookstore owners, I think, was in D.C. who looked at me and kind of sighed and said, "Well, okay, leave one book with me." And I was, I looked around, and some of his shelves were lightly lightly um, stocked, and I was like one book, really? <laughs> one book? And I, of course, smiled and said, well, that would be great. Thank you. But it's just funny to me that he wanted one book. And I, I had said to him, I'll leave you as many as you want. And, you know, you don't even have to pay me if they don't sell. And he still only wanted one book. Mm -hmm. But another bookstore owner was so gracious. He, in fact, said, come on down and flipped on his phone and did we did my first 
first Facebook Live interview, literally in the center of his bookstore, sitting on the couch. He also had a beautiful crystal shop. Um, I wish I could think of the name of that here, but I put that up. I put our, our Facebook interview up on my Facebook page forevermore. What state was this in? Oh, God. Oh, please forgive me. <laughs> That's okay. It'll come to you. I, it, I, it, oh, I know where it was. It was in, in Maine, and it was just before we left the state. So okay. It was, um, uh, I, I, I wish I could say. Was this in Bar I'm, Harbor? Yes, I think it was Bar Harbor or just south of there. He was a delightful man. And like I said, the Facebook video is on my uh, Facebook page for Forevermore, the book. And um, if people wanted to check that out, it's just lovely how you can do that. You can simply go live to Facebook and do a video interview. And then I thanked him and he said, that was really fun. And I said, that was really fun. And I went on down the road. That was the best of my book tour that generous lovely man that's beautiful because you just you never know these connections you're going to make and the responses you get and all of us indie authors michelle can totally relate i can't tell you the number of barnes and noble and other bookstores that i've walked into and you know with all of my gear and hey i'm an author and this is my book it's in your system you know could you stock it i'd love to do a signing um, just, you know, met with the hairy eyeball the majority of the time I had to fight tooth and nail sending, make, leaving messages that, you know, my calls were never returned. My emails were never returned for years to one of the, the local Barnes and Nobles here. And it wasn't until they were doing teen book fest and thankfully I just happened to have one young adult book on the market at the time and I just sent a a very belligerent email that was like look I know you've never returned my calls and my emails but this is what I can do for you I'm a member of this I know this many people I can invite I can get this many people to show up and support I have this I have that you know I just kind of laid it all out um and you know some of it was puffery but, you know, fake it till you make it, right? And finally, the guy got back with me and invited me to come. And I got to present and spend the day with the round table with the teenagers and tell them what it's like to be a published author and how to publish a book. And I got to be on a panel with um, some with Ali Novak and other authors that are way more famous and successful than I am. And I shouldn't have even been there, but it was awesome. <laughs> and And I felt like after that night, I was like, okay, I'm done. I've accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish as an author. I got to do a book signing at Barnes and Noble and a panel and, you know, and it, and I'm it's, I'm here to tell you, you are not done. You are extraordinary. You don't <laughs> like me with your confidence. And I always tell you, if you're this good, this young, you are going to take over the world. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I might, it cracks me up. It cracks up me and my husband when some of your emails you said, if you're this good now, you're going to be dangerous when you're my age. I was like, oh, yes, thank sir. you. Yes, that's true. true. No, and you know. In the very best way. I I appreciate that. Honestly, I look at people like AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm not saying I'm not a democratic socialist, but I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying I look at her. She's my age and what she's doing. And she puts me to shame. I'm like, okay, I'm not doing squat with my life. And look at what some of these other girls my age are doing. But um, that aside, but I appreciate. Before we go on any further, I want to caution you and the listeners against that type of thing. Because if she looked at everything you're doing with your life right now, including with your family and your son, she'd be saying the same thing about herself. So there. Oh, well, thank you. You know, that do, that does put that in just perspective because um, I am incredibly blessed to um, have been married for 11 years and have a beautiful six and a half year old son um, who's just a delight to everybody who meets him and is just this bright light in the world. I'm, I'm so blessed to be his mom. So that, that comes first and foremost for me. Anybody that knows me, uh, that comes before the writing, that comes before all of it. Um, so you're right. There are some people who've done amazing things in their career, um, but they maybe don't yet have a family of their own. And so you're right. And I did, I did take a big break from, um, 
pursuing any kind of stuff with a career in order to raise my family. Um, but then now I've been kind of finding a balance doing it simultaneously. But thank you for that perspective. And, and that You're aside. Welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, let me just say one thing. I, I looked up on Facebook the name of the, the wonderful bookstore where I was yes. so welcomed. It was Merkaba Soul, which is why I can never remember it. And it's in Augusta, Maine southern border of Maine on the coast and uh, Merkaba Soul, two words, it was a lovely lovely crystal bookstore and the gentleman was delightful and I just wanted to say that So thank you for that, if there's anybody in Maine listening, definitely go and um, and be patrons of, <laughs> of that yes, bookstore sure. <laughs> and so I want to get into um, because and you've actually touched on this a couple of times um, and I don't, I won't make it the focus, but it is definitely, I find interesting. Um, you have had readers who have, like me, who've been delighted by your book. Um, you've also had some pushback, particularly from people who are more traditionally uh, minded and from traditionally religious people. Um, I actually had recommended to you, and you did read it, and we had a little discussion about it via email, I think maybe a year or six or nine months ago or something, about the the famous, uh, world famous New Age author and card maker uh, of tarot cards and angel cards, Doreen Virtue. And um, as anybody who's even somewhat familiar with the uh, New Age community may know that in 2017, Doreen Virtue pulled all of her books from her publisher uh, and and stopped um, doing all of her angel readings and said she is converting to Christianity, um, which is kind of funny because she grew up as like a Christian in Christian Science and Unity churches. So we all kind of thought she was Christian to begin with anyway, um, but converting to a more like fundamentalist sect of Christianity and now believes that everything she used to t teach and believe in and write about is um, demonic and satanic and she repents of all of it and warns people not to pick up her old work. Um, and she, she took everything down, her publisher let her go. Um, and now she is giving like daily Bible study readings on Vimeo and posting YouTube interviews, warning people all against the dangers of new age and metaphysical uh, worldview and thought. And lately um, she even published that. I don't know if I've even sent this to you. I found it hysterical um, and, I, and not in any way mocking Christians. I am a Christian, um, but just in that it looked like it was a parody. It looked like something somebody would write to make fun of or parody Christians because um, it was so fearful and it was even saying things that like Harry Potter and unicorns are satanic. Um, I mean, just off the deep end. But anyway, she, she wrote a book about her conversion um, called The Joy of Jesus, The Joy of Jesus by Dorian Virtue. It's actually a free book on her website now um, for anybody who's curious. Um, and part of my reason in recommending that book to you last year was because um, I thought it was interesting as someone from, from the perspective of somebody that used to share most of your beliefs um, that you have held, that you currently hold, and who now now holds the beliefs of the people who have pushed back uh, on your book. And I thought that um, maybe that would shed some light for you, perhaps, on why um, some people, you know, mainstream folk, reject New Age um, or would have been turned off by your story. Um, I just thought it was interesting from somebody who totally sees and understands both perspectives, um, but is now persuaded on the other perspective. And um, and so I just kind of wanted, so, so that just that aside, um, I don't think I ever properly explained to you why I had recommended her book to you. Um, and you said it, it had made you very uncomfortable <laughs> when you were reading it. It was like very, it just felt very dark and, and fearful and um, just that you just felt kind of sick reading it. Um, and I think a lot of people, if you look at the reviews of the book, have had that same reaction. Um, but tell me about 
how, I mean, I think every author, maybe not on a religious perspective, but every author can certainly relate to having people that were offended by their book, that didn't like their book, that left a nasty or negative review that just made that author want to never write another word again. Um, how do you deal personally with with the pushback? And can you talk about like some of your feelings on that and your experiences with that? I have to say that for the first year, everywhere I went to talk about my book, women especially, and some men were delighted to talk with me. And even at the library, I had a, uh, an older guy who, who was actually a, uh, uh, he was a physicist of some sort and um, begrudgingly sat, you can always tell when they've been taken drug there by their wives, but even he, I got to smiling. Um, I, I understand that there are people who don't believe as I do. And I understand that some people consider my beliefs to be kind of daffy or, or mindless or silly. What worries me always is the fear and the closed mind, because I believe that creates um, the dangerous situations that ultimately, like in the Middle East, fundamentalism results sometimes in terrorism because they are, they have to so strongly hold on to their beliefs and they can't be shaken or, or they wouldn't have any beliefs and then they wouldn't be who they thought they were. And, um, and I don't, I don't mean to call those, that sounds, I, I guess that's the extreme version of fearful believing, mm-hmm. but in my own life, for my first experience was a book club where several, excuse me, several Christian women were so upset about my appearing at their book club that they they couldn't even attend. One woman showed up at my friend's house a half an hour before the book club and said, I'm sorry, I I just can't come. Uh, The topic was so upsetting to them because they've been told that the topic is sinful. Um, And I just, that always makes, makes me, it makes me worry when people are, close their minds to such things and are afraid of such things. And within the week, a biblical scholar who I had met and who read my book wrote this beautiful review on my um, Amazon page about how everything in my book occurs in the Bible. Wow. So it was interesting. Both of those reactions are extreme. The ladies not wanting to meet me because they thought I was horrible or they were afraid of me. I'm not sure which. And the biblical scholar who had just published a thick college level educational book on on the three major religions uh, Christianity and uh, Judaism and Islam and was saying that my book was he enjoyed it and that it it, uh, it, it was it had similar experiences in in its storyline that the Bible has in its storyline so um, both as I, as I said both of those reactions struck me as is interesting um, I loved the words of the biblical scholar, of course, because I don't feel sinful at all. But I was sad for the ladies who didn't take the opportunity to at least hear what I had to say and to consider that um, that there are other ways to look at things that aren't sinful. And aren't what is it? What is it that people are calling out specifically that they think is so sinful about your book? Um, I think the mere fact that it includes um, mediumship. It actually takes place in Lilydale, which is a real-life community in New York, about an hour from my home. And it's a it's a hundred-year-old community. It's older than that, maybe 150 years old. And mediums, uh, you have to be a certified medium to reside in these beautiful little lakeside cottages in this wonderful little community. And so my much of my story takes place there. And many Catholics believe that spiritualism is work of the devil, that many Catholics believe that being psychic is work of the devil. Um, and, and yet spiritualists, many spiritualists are Christian and believe in both Jesus and the ability to talk to the dead. Um, I think that Jesus also wanted us to know that we live on and, and spiritualists just want to be able to provide evidence to people that that's true. Gotcha. And, and also, I just want to point out that um, it's certainly not just Catholics, it's, um, you know, a lot of Protestants, or especially evangelicals, Oh, thank you for catching me on that. Um, That's that's correct. I'm sorry. I I was raised Catholic, so, and 
these ladies happen to be Catholic. So yes, uh, but it's true of, of some Christians who believe that that this is somehow bad, and and I think it's the essence in my belief system, our ability to talk with God and connect with the divine, and to to understand that life goes on. That's the that's the height of connectedness to God, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, no, I keep going. <laughs> well, keep going. and you know, uh, Jesus. Oh my gosh, I talk to Jesus all the time, and and I don't think he he needs for me to be reborn again to ascend into heaven. Um, the research of near death experiences shows that every religion gets into heaven, and even those who don't believe in God get into heaven. So it's hard to say definitively what what's on God's mind, and I always. I always get a little nervous when people try to talk for God. None of us actually know, and all we can turn to is the uh, real life experiences of people who believe that they have ascended to heaven. That's why I'm kind of a, I'm a lifelong, uh, my entire adult life I've been fascinated by near death experiences because as a journalist, I understand these are true life accounts of many, many hundreds of thousands of people who have died and come back to tell about it. and. The stories are almost universally extraordinary and hopeful and inspirational. They change the lives of people who have them. What's fascinating to me too, just on a personal level, is um, my mom as well. Like she will sit and read near-death experience stories on the internet. She sent me countless, you know, websites or um, articles. Um, she loves videos and movies, and documentaries about NDEs. Um, she reads every single book that's like ever been on the market by a doctor who, you know, had patients that died and came back and what they reported they saw and that how they knew things that they couldn't have possibly known. Like they knew what their sister was wearing and what she was doing at the exact time who lived, you know, a hundred miles away, um, things like that. Um, she's read every book by, um, there are several books by neurosurgeons and, and such, um, even doctors who they themselves have had NDEs. And so it's really interesting that you and my mom are of about the same generation and you have the same interest, the same hobby, really, because it's, it's, I think for both of you, it's like a hobby reading up on, on this. It's, for me, it's so much, and I think for your mom as well, it's beyond. Or beyond I, I a hobby, say, per, it's yeah. A, it's, it's an obsession. If you okay. Look at my phone, you would think I was the daughter of darkness, the way so many of my books talk about <laughs> life after death and the death experience, and there's hundreds of books on myself. I'm always worried I'm going to lose it. People are going to go, what is wrong with this? <laughs> Somebody who's who's writing a book on the topic would have all the books on the no and, and I think and I think that's it's really interesting because um you can have two people who are who are family and who are so similar and who have the, the similar um borderline obsession, you know, in a in a hobby of something that you both are so fascinated with, but you two are are of very different persuasions. I'd say opposite ends of the spectrum. My mom is very traditional and and very conservative um, in in her spiritual beliefs, and um, and I carry a degree of that uh, with me. Um, but then at the same time, um, I've also done a lot of research. Um, I have participated in uh, you know various religious practices. I come from a blend of religion on my dad's side. I have Jewish heritage on my mom's side. Um, I was baptized Catholic. Her family is Catholic, but my stepdad um, is Southern Baptist slash evangelical. And so my mom, um, when I was growing up, at least in my mom and stepdad's household, that's what we were. Those were the churches we attended. So um, I'm very blended spiritually and I see all sides and um you know, I might have preferences one way or another. Um, do I believe any group of, of people apart from um, people committing horrible, you know, acts against humanity? Do I believe that um, any other group of people is going to hell uh, because they happen to be of a different religious or spiritual persuasion? No, I, I can't honestly look myself in the mirror and say that I believe that. I just know, I know what I believe. I know what I'm comfortable with. Um, and I also know that I would never shun somebody or refuse to hear them or refuse to read their book. 
um, just because, you know, I, I know what I believe and I might be of another persuasion, but I am, I pride myself on an open mind, um, with, within reason. And, and your book is definitely, certainly within reason. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, I've, I've edited erotic, uh, I guess you could call it erotica, um, not necessarily by choice. It was, I, I agreed to do an editing job having, and somebody, the client classified it as romance and I had no idea it was that kind of romance. <laughs> and yes. so I've read and edited books that were just, um, outrageous. I mean, you want to talk about sinful, I mean, just, uh, outrageous details. I, I don't want to get into, um, in this interview, but, <laughs> but your book, it's, it's hysterical that, um, your book is so sweet and thoughtful and open-minded and deep and, um, and yeah, I mean, you, I guess you, you stretch convention or you stretch the rules a little of, you know, there, there is some, um, in the romance, you know, there is sort of like a, uh, there's almost like this menage a trois, um, going on between the man who's channeling the dead man that your main character is in love with, um, and, and her, and there's, you know, the, that the three souls are, are connected. Um, so there, there is like this like menage aspect to the romance, but it, that's very tame compared to what's out there. You guys like, this is not, you know, <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I, I do like to think that it's very tame and almost beautiful in the way they all come to love each other. It sounds even more bizarre when I said, I, when I just said that, but it is all based on love and um, it actually, I of all the things I had read, I I, uh, I have actually read real or true accounts, alleged true accounts of this actually happening, um, where a man. Uh, it sounds wow. It sounds way worse when you say it out loud. <laughs> but, but it works in the book. I mean, I I fought, like I'm totally sold on the story and the characters, and I love. Forgive me. It's it's been years since I read the book. What what's the man's name? The wid the widower. Um, Sebastian and Albert. So the widower Albert. is is Albert, and the spirit is Sebastian. And Albert channels Sebastian for um, um, Rebecca, our, my main character, so that she can spend some time with him. And I I love Albert. He he is like the quintessential like he's my type. Just these like gentle, kind of soft-spoken, you know, somewhat older guy. I just have such a soft spot for, um, I, I know in a lot of my romances, the heroes do tend to be the ones with all the swagger and all the, all the personality. Yes. In, in real life, I do not trust men like that. I can't stand men like that. Um, I like them as movie characters. I like them as tropes. Um, but in, in real life, I those men to me are one thing. They are dishonest in my opinion. They're cheaters. They're not the type of guy you settle down with. Albert is the kind of guy you settle down with. And and so it's funny because I kind of write, but, but see, when I have written, um, I guess I have kind of woven in my preferred type of hero into some of my books in Secrets of Artemis. Yes, you have. Um, yes. Orion. Yes. yes, you have. Yes. Um, so, so Orion and Secrets of Artemis, um, I did use a more, uh, not so well, much... Oh, go in ahead. the Jordania series, that uh, lovely gentle giant. Um, oh, Boz, yeah. But see, he wasn't the he wasn't the love interest though of the main character. Oh. So, um, so but I did I did nod to that type, um, but I didn't let him be kind of the star of the show and the love interest because it just didn't work with those two particular characters. But then going forward, I've I've um you know I'm I'm not much into the alpha male. Um, personality. I just, I tend to think those kinds of men aren't any good in real life, but they're great for fiction. <laughs> they're great for the romance genre. Um, but no, that's why I loved Albert. And, and what's funny too, though, is that Sebastian, you know, is that like, he reminded me of my character, John. Um, and he was like a womanizer and um, very charming and, and expansive and kind of gregarious like aspects about him. Um, but but he's dead and so at least in this current incarnation for rebecca 
um, you know, she can't be with him, but she can be with, with Albert. And so, um, I just, it was, it was a really sweet, um, it, it was just a really touching romance. Um, and, and I think readers will, uh, romance readers will like your book if they want this, if they want something different. Um, it's not just, it's not a genre romance per se. It's not a traditional romance, um, but it is a love story that's in your subtitle. It's a love story. It is a romance. Um, but it also weaves in many of these metaphysical factors. Um, that's where it comes into um, where I kind of say it's it's like what dreams may come. That was a romance as well, except that took a very tragic and and hellish kind of turn. And your book doesn't doesn't have um, that kind of content, thankfully. Um, so it's it's just a pleasant light read. Um, I cannot believe that we have been going for over an hour and fifteen. <laughs> this flew by. Um, I want to ask you if there was anything else that you wanted to have a chance to say or to cover uh, that we didn't get to. No, I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am for our relationship. And I appreciate that you consider me a mentor, but um, I need you to know that you have mentored me as well. And uh, for that, I am always going to be grateful. Thank you so much. That that just I wish you could see the smile on my face <laughs> if we were doing the video chat then you would <laughs> thank okay. you that sending means the world a, a, a digital hug so. yeah <laughs> sending a digital hug Michelle thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me and uh, for your time today and I I really encourage folks to download your free book gifts yet to open um, and check out Forevermore. There's a sample of that, as Afra mentioned, um, in, in the back of her free book, so you can kind of get a taste of it. Um, that just about does it for today's episode of Enough of My Books, Let's Talk About Yours. If you like what you heard here today and you want to hear more from some other great authors, then please consider subscribing here to my YouTube channel. And as always, you can get a hold of me at ckbrook.com. Um, Michelle, thank you again, and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. So my pleasure, Katie. Back at you. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, talk soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>